So welcome back. This video is going to give a quick review of one-way analysis of variance. So while this module is on cluster analysis, a lot of the notation is the same as what you get in one-way ANOVA, except that with cluster analysis, we're doing it in p dimensions, whereas with one-way ANOVA, we're doing it in one dimension. So it's really important to understand the notation in the simplest setting, so the one-way ANOVA case, before we move on to the p-dimensional case. The reason I give this review is that while it's a topic that's covered in just about every introductory statistics textbook on the planet, it's one of those topics that often gets omitted. So if you've already had a good course on design of experiments, or you had a really good introductory statistics sequence where the topic did get covered, you can skip this video. Otherwise, you probably want to watch it just to understand the notation in the simple case. So what's one-way ANOVA used for? It tends to get used when you have a discrete independent variable and a numerical dependent variable. So this often arises when you have, say, big K treatments. So maybe I have big K drugs, and I randomly assign patients to treatment groups where patients in group one get drug one, and so forth. Then what I do is I take some efficacy measure, so this is how well the drug worked, and I'm gonna assume that these efficacy measures, so the, the, the measure of respondent I to drug K, will have some mean for treatment K plus some random noise. Now the assumptions that we make on these errors is usually that they're normal, that they have a common variance, so that's called the homoscedastic assumption, and they all have mean zero. So I'm going to go over to my document camera and draw a picture of this. So this is the efficacy measure X, and we have our treatments. Let's say that we have big K equal to three. So there are three treatments in this case. This will be treatment one, treatment two, treatment three, or if you want, you can call this A, B, and C. It's a categorical variable. I think it's easiest to draw this with box plots. So let's say that this is the box plot for the effic efficacy measures using drug A, and this is the box plot. Now, remember, I'm assuming homoscedastic errors so what that means is the spread has to be the same. And then maybe this is the um, measure of X for treatment three. And if it helps, you can think of picturing normal distributions above all of these, where each one of these has standard deviation sigma sub epsilon, sigma epsilon, sigma epsilon. We can call this the homo scedastic case. The heteroscedastic case would look something like this. Here's X, here's treatment A, B, and C. We have a very small distribution with uh, A, maybe a very large distribution for B, and something in between for C. So this would be heteroscedastic. And we're not allowed to do this with one-way ANOVA, that we would need a more complicated model. I should also show the treatment means on this plot. So this is going to be mu1 or mu a, let's use letters, mu b, and mu c. Likewise down on the heteroscedastic version. So what's giving rise to the data is that drug A has a certain level of efficacy but then there's other factors that may affect that, and we lump those into the errors. One-way analysis of variance starts out by testing what I refer to as a screening hypothesis. And the screening hypothesis is that all the treatment means are the same. So all the drugs work the same. The alternative is that at least one of the treatments has a different mean. We first do this test, 
And if we can't reject this null hypothesis, this is like there's nothing going on, there are no differences, we would stop. If we do reject it, then we go off and we do additional tests to determine which drug works better than the others. We're not so interested in that second, second step right now. When you do design of experiments, that, that second step is probably more important than the first step. Well, I'm going to assume that there are n sub k observations in group k. So I'm going to use little k to index groups. We're going to keep using the same convention when we get to clustering. k ranges from 1 to big K. The total number of observations that I have in the study is going to be little n, and so then little n is just going to be the sum of n sub k. x i k will be the outcome or the response variable measurement for observation i, ranging from 1 to n sub k in group k. So whenever we do a hypothesis test, we're fundamentally comparing some test statistic that we would get under the null hypothesis. So if we assume that all the means were the, were the same, what would happen? Versus if we relax that assumption, what would happen? If we were to assume that all the means were the same, then we could just pool all of our observations together. So let's add up all of these x's across groups and within the group, divide by n. We're going to call that the grand mean. Just as a, an illustration of this, let's say I had a situation like this, where maybe the mean of group A looks like that, the mean of group B looks something like this, the mean of group C is maybe just a smidgen low, so all means equal. Then it would be silly to estimate mu A, mu B, and mu C separately. We could just average all of the x values to find some grand mean. So we can think of this as the grand mean. Alternatively, when the means are very different from each other, as they are up in this earlier situation that I drew, then we'd want to be able to estimate them separately. So we often use what's called the dot notation. So we put a dot in place of a subscript that we average over. So x bar dot dot means go average over all subjects, that's the first dot, and all groups, that's the second dot. Often we'll just forget the dots and call this x bar, versus the sample mean for treatment group k, we're going to call x bar dot k. So the dot part is we're going to average over all the observations within the group, but we're not going to average over groups. So you can think about the grand mean is the model you'd get under the null hypothesis, whereas allowing separate sample means is what you'd get under the alternative hypothesis that at least one of these means is different. So let's just go estimate them all. Well, having formed the estimates of these means, we now need a measure of how well each of those models performs. So we're going to summarize that with the least squares criterion. So if we were to assume the null hypothesis were true and have a single mean summarizing everything, then this quantity would give us the least squares criterion. So how far is each of my x variables from this grand mean? We're going to add them up. We're going to call this the total sums of squares and denote it by SST. Some books might call it TSS instead for total sums of squares or the sum of square totals. The way to think about this measure is it's the total variation in the response variable. Under the alternative hypothesis, we would have different means for different groups. So how much information is lost if we use k-means instead of, say, one mean, which is what we would have with this null model. Well, in that case, I'm going to find out how far each observation is from its respective group mean and square it. We have a number of names for this quantity. Perhaps the most common is the sum of squared errors, 
and that's the term that you would have encountered in your regression class probably. With ANOVA, we often call it the within-group sum of squares, so SSW is sometimes used. Another term that gets used is RSS for residual sums of squares. So the way to think about these measures is that SST is the total variation that's unexplained by using a single mean. SSE or SSW is the total variation that's not explained if you give yourself big K means. Another measure that we're going to use is called the between group sums of squares. The between group sums of squares answers the question, how different are my K means? So we're going to take the difference between mean K and the grand mean and square it, then we'll weight by the number of cases in that group. So if we go back to this picture, the grand mean is going to be roughly here. So if I sample from this, this is going to be x bar dot dot. What the between sums of squares says is how different is the group mean from the grand mean, whereas the within group says how far are the observations from the group means. The total sums of squares would be how far are the observations from the grand mean. So notice in the bottom picture, the between group sums of squares is tiny. So we would say SSB is tiny. Whereas in this top picture, we would say SSB is, uh, is, is fairly large. So let's just say big. Now there's a very important identity. It's called the ANOVA identity, which says this. The total sums of squares equals the between sums of squares plus the within or air sums of squares. So total equals between plus within is another way to state the ANOVA identity. So we have really three rows in this table. The first row describes what the model does. The last row describes the total variation in the data, which would be what you get under the null hypothesis that that there are no differences between the groups and we can just summarize everything with a single mean. The middle row, I like to think of as what the model doesn't do. You can also think of this as between, within, and total. Now with an ANOVA table, we usually add vertically and we divide across. If we think about our sums of squares, we take between plus within, we get the total. That's just the ANOVA identity. Likewise with the degrees of freedom. So k minus one plus n minus k equals n minus one. So the way I like to think about this is with the total model, I have to estimate one thing, the grand mean. The remaining observations can be used to assess the variance. The model you can think of as using k minus one degrees of freedom. So there's a grand mean and then how do the other uh, groups differ from that? Well, I would need k minus one dummies in that case. The remaining observations get used to estimate the error. Well, the sums of squares are total quantities. They represent the total vari variation in the data or the total of the sums of squares. We're often interested in variances. So if we divide across, we end up with variance estimates. So let me point out that if we take SST divided by its degrees of freedom, we get the sample variance. So S squared sub X is one over N minus one, sum I equals one to N, XI minus X bar squared. That's the quantity that you saw back in your basic stats class. That's SST. So this is the total variation in the data. We get the sample variance. Likewise, if we divide SSE by N minus K, we get an estimate of these sigma sub E's squared. We'd have to square them to get the variances, but that's how we would estimate the amount of within group variation. We often call this the mean square between and this is the mean squared error or the mean square within. If we were to compute the ratio of those, we have an F statistic, 
that F statistic is what gets reported whenever you do a one-way analysis of variance. We then look up the tail probability of that F statistic using these degrees of freedom to find the p-value that allows us to test this null hypothesis. I'll just mention a few other properties that come out of this. R squared is the fraction of variation explained by the model. So that is the between group sums of squares over the total group sums of squares. Often we write this a different way though. So using the ANOVA identity, we can solve for SSB, that's SST minus SSE over SST. Of course, SST over SST is one. So you can think of this as one minus the fraction of variation unexplained by the model, which is SSE over SST. I didn't write it here, but adjusted R squared it is simply one minus the mean squared error over the sample variance, SST over N minus one. So a lot of these concepts are gonna be used in cluster analysis. And so it's important that you understand the notation and these concepts of between and within group variance. And we're also gonna come back and use the F statistic in uh, cluster analysis as well.